Yep. <clears throat> so, okay. will this go out live or will this go out? No, 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 no. We're not live. Edited. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. yeah in case I make a mistake or. You know, yeah, yeah. In case you, I ask you a question trouble. you don't want to answer. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Or in case it get you in trouble. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I will not be in trouble, coach. I'm, uh, you know, AFF anyway doesn't like me, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> So, so first of all, where, where will this go out? Where will this go out? YouTube or? Uh, it will be YouTube and uh, on all the podcast platforms as well. Yeah. So if you send me a link when it's ready, I'll share it. Sure, so sure. I, yeah. Apparently, I've got a big reach. I don't know what it means, but apparently, a lot of people will see it. Oh, perfect. And that'll be very great for us as well. Right. Yeah. So, uh, Coach, first of all, thank you. Thank you so much for doing this. Uh, really appreciate you taking the time uh, you're someone i wanted to talk to for a long time so really looking forward to this okay if I start whenever you want to yeah yeah so uh, first let me start with the book that is coming out it's coming out next month it's going to be uh, your memoir so to speak about your journey in football and things uh, it's called the word itinerant coach the footballing life and times of steve darby yeah uh, the, the itinerant coach basically uh, itinerant means someone who's travelled a lot, doesn't stay in one place, which in a sense, I've been very lucky to have that career. Uh, I've been in the right place at the right time a number of times. Uh, I've met good people, mostly, 99%. I've met good people who have really enjoyed knowing. Um, and the book, was. I had a few people ask me, could, could they write a biography of me. I said, yeah, sure. But only one guy really followed through, which was Anthony Sutton. And he he wrote a biography, which basically is warts and all. He researched it superbly. He got people who didn't like me. He spoke to them as well. Uh, he told the truth about things. So it, it isn't sort of a glorified book. It's, uh, I hope, the truth. So if anybody who reads it, they'll get honesty, I hope. And I know that will upset a few people. Um, usually the administrators who I've probably continued to clash all throughout my career and some journalists, not all journalists, some are great and the journalists are needed, but some have got different ethics, shall we say. Every country's got different ethics of like journalism and I'll say administration as well. Yes, absolutely. So I actually wanted to ask you to, because your career spanned for such a long time, across so many of the Asian countries and across Australia as well. I mean, England, when you started, it's got so much, right? Like Thailand, Vietnam, Laos. So uh, is there any memories that stand out to you? And I want one from India at least, and maybe somewhere else as well. Yeah, I mean, lots of things happen behind the scenes, really, uh, which is what, as a fan, because I'm a football fan first, uh, I want to know, I used to want to know what happened to Liverpool. Uh, and now when I was a kid, you never found out anything because the media didn't write about it. And there was no social media, of course, in my time. So now the social media's come out, there's a lot less stories. But there's a couple of, you know, for example, the difference in culture. First time I was working with uh, Peter Reid, uh, we were playing a Thailand's first international match. Half time, we're walking down the tunnel and I could see Peter Reid was absolutely steaming with anger. So I ran down, grabbed hold of him and held him against the wall. said, look, don't do what you're going to do. He said, how do you know what you're going to do? I said, I know you're going to hammer. And he was going to hammer a player called Datsacorn, who was probably our best player, but he wasn't doing what we asked. And he was causing us a lot of problems. So I said, get him one-to-one, -one, deal with it one-to-one -one, into his face. He'll handle it. But don't do it in front of the whole dressing room. I said, because you're not in England. You're in Thailand. And in Thailand, they have a, a concept called saving face. And it was really important that you didn't embarrass anybody in public, even in football culture. You had to literally uh, you know, do something privately. And he accepted it like a professional, but not publicly. I said, if you do it publicly in front of the players, his hamstring will get tight. Five or six of his mates suddenly won't be at the 100% best. You and, you know, and Peter Reid was very, very clever football-wise and clever intelligent-wise. Uh, he did it at Staticorn one-to-one, -one, got a great second half out of him. Uh, Indian aspect. Yeah. One of the funniest yeah. things I ever saw was when I was at Mohan Bagan, one of the goalkeepers said to me, coach, can, 
I go skipping after training with a couple of the lads. I said, yeah, of course you can. Anyone's welcome to do extra training anytime. Never a problem. Said, Thanks, coach. He went down to the bottom end of the pitch and I could see five or six of them. No problem. So I thought I'll go down and just watch them and give them a bit of support. So I went down there and they're skipping, but with no ropes. <laughs> and I looked and I thought, what's going on? So we haven't got any ropes, coach, but we know what we're doing. And so he was actually doing all the skipping motions, the changing of hands, the faster motions, and the lads were keeping with him. But I've never ever seen anywhere skipping without ropes before. And uh, it, it was just a fascinating place. And behind the scenes as well, I, I discovered at times um, the caste system, which I found appalling, I'll be honest. Uh, you know, and I've, I've found many Indians find the, the caste system appalling. Obviously, usually the lower caste find it even worse. But um, yeah, I, I had a boot man, a lad who, uh, who cleaned the boots. All the players, you know, he, he cleaned all the boots of the players. So end of the month, I gave him a tip. And next minute, one of the officials come charging down to me saying, you can't do that. I said, hey, it's my money. I can do what I want with my money. He said, oh, he'll want it off all the players. And I said, well, do you mean they don't tip him? He said, no. I said, well, they're going to from now on. I said, because that's, you know, that's part of the culture. You look after people who look after you. I then found out what I'd given him as a tip was probably his monthly wage. You know, and, and I suddenly found the disparity of the wealth in India between the top and the bottom was beyond my beyond my imagination you know it was uh, and that was examples of how I, I found it amazing amazing country I loved it uh, but every day was a learning experience uh, and again if we look at culture I talked about journalists I had I never ever criticize any player in public I'll do it to his face I'll do it in the dressing room you know if it's the right the right country. And then one of the players came up to me, international player, I said, coach, did you say this about me? And I said, no, of course I wouldn't. I said, I wouldn't say it anyway. And I'd never say it in a, in a paper. And it was a Bengali paper. So obviously I couldn't read it you know, in Bengali. So I got it translated. And of course it was absolute rubbish. I rang up the editor. I rang up the journalist at first, couldn't get him. I rang up the editor, his boss. I thought, I'm going to take this to the top. And I said, look, I not only didn't say it, I never met this guy. So how on earth he's ever even got near it? It wasn't even out of context. He just said it. And the bloke just said, oh, well, if he didn't put a story in, he wouldn't get paid. And I said, well, I said, so he's made a lie up and you've published it. He said, yeah. I said, well, you can't do that. I said, I will never speak to that man again. And I won't even speak to your paper again. Because that's just, it's got to be two ways, this. You know, there were some good journalists, uh, in, in, in Bengal or in Calcutta, but there was a, a crop of, of them who were very, I felt, very ethically poor. So, you know, that was that was some of the behind the scenes stories in, in India, you know. <laughs> so you having worked in India, right? And uh, you worked at a time when there was no ISL uh, and you were working with the biggest team of them all, possibly, you know, arguably the big, uh, biggest brand in Indian football, per se. Then you worked in the ISL. So now we are six, seven years in into the ISL uh, bandwagon. Well, bet between, I was working obviously with Mohan mm. Bagan, uh, and I'll be honest, it didn't work out well. Mm. Some of it had to be my fault. That's the real world. It doesn't it's work out well for anybody, to be fair, in Mohan Bagan. <laughs> they well, always end up sack. <laughs> even now, I follow it now. They've got into the ISL with ATK, and now they want to get rid of ATK. You know, so yeah. it's. Um, you know, it was a complex club. It was it was described to me as the Man United of Asia. And then I suddenly found out the Man United of Asia had cow dung on the pitch, mm. on the training pitch. It had no... The, the dressing rooms were filthy. The gym was underwater. Uh, there was no sponsor. There was no club shop. All that massive enthusiasm. Some great fans. And they had nowhere to buy a shirt. So, it, you know, it wasn't Man United of Asia. It could have been, mm. but it wasn't. Mm. But, you know, there's a lot of history there, and I value history. And, the, and the, what the club did, 
know, in the famous people who beat the British, fantastic. I really respect that and I enjoy it, but it could have been so much better at the time. But between I-League and ISL, I, I went to somewhere else, but before yeah. I finished with Mohan, I wanted to, with Mohan, to play. I had a squad that was too big. I made a mistake. I came in after the players had been chosen. My fault. I would never, only ever done it once again. And the same thing happened, a disaster. You should always try and get your players. I wanted to play the youth team players and my reserves in the Calcutta League. Oh, you thought I was asking for a million pound a week. Oh, no, we've got to win the Calcutta League. I said, yeah, but you're not getting your players training. You're not giving the young boys experience. And you've also got a risk of injuries because some of the pitches were awful and some of the players were thugs in the Calcutta League. I said, you've got to look after your good players for the I-League. Another cultural battle, which was I lost, you know. So, anyway, between ISL and I-League, I went to Manipur. Uh, I got a call from a fellow called uh, Anoj Jikla, who's like an agent and a marketing uh, company. He said, Manipur, which I'd never heard of, I'll be honest, wanted, wanted someone to run a, a, a course for a month. And that was basically to get the best 30-odd youth players and teach them how to be professional. I thought, OK, I'll try that. I've never done it before. Uh, I laid out exactly what I wanted to do with the players. Well, the first thing is I really enjoyed it. That's the first thing. I found the people honest, sincere. The administrators were superb there. Absolutely superb. In the middle of a poverty-stricken area, they had a superb FIFA pitch. And obviously, they'd spent all the money correctly. No one seems to have taken a cut-off somewhere, which happens in many countries around the world. But these people have done everything superb. I asked for portable goals. Portable goals arrived the next day. So we had the first thing I had to do, though, is stop these lads training too much. Because they said they wanted them to train twice a day. I said, well, and seven days a week. I said, you can't go from training two or three nights a week to 14 sessions a week. You just can't do it. I said, what well, first thing will happen is they'll get injured. I said, so you just cannot do it. So I, I did football in the afternoon. And then in the mornings, I did some weight training with them. So a different set of muscles were being used. And it was teaching them to get stronger as well. Uh, and I actually gave them a day off, which was like unheard of. I said, no, you need a day off. Every footballer at the highest level has to physically have a day off and mentally. But they were magnificent. I mean, the example, we had a day off. And on my first day off, a car turns up at the hotel with some of the admin. I said, come on, we're taking you out, coach. OK, great. Yeah, I like to see where I am. I had to go around and see places driving through a really bad area. I thought, where are we going? Suddenly, we turned the end of this road into a cemetery. And it was a chindit cemetery. And in there, it was absolutely full of beautiful rose, rose trees everywhere. Green lawns uh, yeah, and then hundreds upon hundreds of graves of mostly British young lads. I, I was going along, look at them, 18-year-old, 19-year-old. These are people, I didn't even know about these battles that were going on at, in the Second World War. And there was so many Indian, Indian lads, British lads, Aussie lads were killed fighting the Japanese in that area, which I knew nothing about, which is, which is my fault, a disgrace on my part. And my British history lessons are not very good. But, you know, this was a, a really sort of brought my faith back and... They were you know, players, good players they were. Some have gone on to the I-League. More, I think, would have gone on if they'd had a better opportunity. I mean, now that the North East is up there, you're in the ISL, they've got an opportunity. I mean, I think it's a fantastic area. Love the place. Yeah, so one of the things that... Uh, so I've been little culture obsessed, as I told you in the, in the email that we were exchanging. And the things that you learn when you read more and more about the history and how the football took, you know, sort of took root in that area, whether it's from the British coming in and then institutionalization through the church and all those kind of things. And we generally try, tend to put this thing as Northeast, like a group of states, 
but they're actually uh, seven different places and all of them individually have so many differences right mizoram is more touch based football and manipur is a lot more physical and you know they have a lot of military sort of a attitude towards it because a lot of them do go on to military and things so it's just fascinating and you as someone i feel like you've really got on to the whole culture of football wherever you've gone to reading well, your interviews and things like that yeah i think you have to because the first thing is you're not going to beat culture any anybody that comes in and thinks i'm going to change india well <laughs> put this way the british raj didn't change india did he <laughs> so steve darby a football coach isn't going to change india so you have to accept that and so many coaches from from you i say europe germans brazilians you know south americans english they fail and they fail because they try and impose their values on a different culture and it just doesn't work the the best advice i was given was by a malaysian uh, a malaysian lady actually her name was mazita and she told me be like bamboo and i looked and i thought there's not much bamboo in liverpool so i didn't know you know what she meant she said be prepared to bend sometimes don't snap and that snap would be the president picking your team or match fixing and things like this bend a little sometimes listen to people and you have to do it i had a striker in malaysia who rang me up one morning national team striker very good salary rings me up coach i can't come training i said why he says are you sick he said oh, no no i'm okay he says but my mum said i've got to take her shopping and i said you're an international footballer you can't just say your mum's taking you shopping and he said coach you can find me you can drop me but i got to go do what my mum says and i spoke to the captain and he says coach you've got no chance he has to do what his mum says and uh, i had an indian i had an indian malay boy big center back called nanthakuma great lad great footballer he come up to me with a wedding invite and he said i said oh, thanks very much i'm happy to go and he says i looked at it i said you can't go that's a big or a big game that day he mm. says i'm sorry coach and I, i knew i knew he didn't want to, he, he didn't want to get he wanted to play and i said look i know your wife or your future wife she would understand he said coach it's nothing to do with me or my wife it's our families they've got together and the numbers are right and the numbers mean we're going to get married at indian wedding on that day and there was nothing i could do about it so i i learned that no point getting angry at him because it it wasn't in his power so you have to adapt be like bamboo yeah it's there are similar things right in diwali and things like that when you come over and suddenly it's an off day for the players which doesn't like you, you in england they play during christmas right or, or oh, just before yeah, and all yeah. that yeah i mean in malaysia you, you would have certain hari raya and certain days where you just this wouldn't play the valley and of course in malaysia when i was there it was different there was chinese malaysians indian malaysians malay malaysians so you had all sorts of holidays the british don't care you know we just we just play we play i always played on boxing day and i saw that meant i trained on christmas day it doesn't mean anything to me you know we are certainly less religious and possibly footballs are religion that could be one way of saying it but we're also less family based as well i found in asia the family meant more to a player than it does to me uh it it just it, you know the extended family in asia is so important it wasn't that important to me same with african lads often the african lads who have signed are literally sending their salaries back to pay for the whole village mm. you know and they they end up broke themselves because they're funding their extended family totally different mentality to me you know yeah i've heard the same stories from runners you know distance runners when they come in and you talk to them they always talk about i need to buy cattle or land and build a house yes. all these kind yeah. of things mm. so yeah uh, just generally talking about indian how what is your experience in the indian the altered the culture not particularly mohan bagan sense or uh, mumbai for that matter but generally overall like what was the experience like for uh, outsider because we've heard stories from so many different people 
and a lot of them come and go very quickly but uh, you've been here you worked in manipur you worked in kolkata two of the very you know strong culturally strong football uh, football areas and a metropolitan place like mumbai where it's it's there but it's not as strong so what was your general experience like well i realized after i'd worked with the i worked with the india star as well star india sorry where we went around all the country commentating i basically learned those 22 countries in one <laughs> india to me is not a country it's a continent and it's a miracle that it hasn't exploded in terms of you know ra- racial disharmony so something someone somewhere is doing something right because it's so peaceful it, it appears to be obviously peaceful as an outsider i mean there's there's things i i found hard to understand the caste system the poverty uh the way some people treat other people badly i found that so difficult to understand i'm not saying the english are perfect believe me we're not but i i just found it was heightened it would seem to be i mean one of the players i got to know very well he said coach the indians are the most racist people in the world he said you english treat us better than fellow indians treat us he was from a certain part of the country and i i just i, I just learned you know and i mean there was just some incredible things going on while i was there that as you say it was a, the love of cricket I, i love cricket i really enjoy it and i used to go and watch cricket games on these they're not even pieces of grass they were just like wrecks of of pieces of land and some of the cricketers were outstanding you know magnificent cricketers and i'm going you know I, i would love to have played there because i because i did i loved the game in england but you realize this game is is grab the culture you know and i i read a great deal about the history of of the cricket and how it was you know it, it evolved anti colonial almost mm. i can't remember the name of the there was a famous film which i thought was wonderful about the cricket where the indians ended up beating Lagan. the white yes the yes, yeah, yeah looked it you know, even the dancing <laughs> you know <laughs> I got to like Hollywood uh, movie Bollywood movies dancing yeah. before I thought it was strange but after watching a few like the bodyguard I saw uh oh my god yeah a journalist <laughs> took me um Sampurna she took me Sampurna Chakrabuti she took me to watch the bodyguard because she said you have to go and see a you know a, a real movie oh it was brilliant loved it you know um I can't remember the big guy the big Salman guy Khan? Ended up, sorry Salman Khan Salman Khan yes because yeah, yeah. later I got to meet Ranbir Kapoor oh. now I'd never heard of Ranbir Kapoor I'll, I'll be honest you know but and I, I ended up dancing with him uh, <laughs> at, at the Mumbai cricket club uh, and so I've danced with Ranbir and when I tell my Indian mates in England that I've danced with Ranbir Kapoor whoa you know, they, they love it you know again that's a totally different culture you know so uh, you know again this 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 journalist in this case the samperna she taught me so much about the culture things like no don't say anything about that shut your mouth close your eyes because you know what are you going to do anyway you can't change i can't yeah. change anything yeah actually i agree with this uh, 100% like india is a continent and uh, i i'm from kerala from the southernmost yep. state so for me the bodyguard movie it first came it was a malayalam movie that's my mother tongue and they yep. remade it in hindi and uh, the movie transformed the way it was shown in uh, malayalam movie and how it goes to bollywood it transforms like there is a lot more bravado there's a lot more the hero is a lot more heroic and and uh, the in malayalam it's a little more subtle the hero is not as you know strong and powerful as the as salman khan's character is and it often happens so culturally it changes every time they remake the movie from malayalam industry or tamil industry it changes a lot because it has to cater to the cultural and taste of the yeah. audience so for me it's like a big no no like you, you you did not do this justice yeah. to this but then the massive hits i also later i got involved in a i did the football choreo- choreography choreography for student of the year and that was filmed in thailand i can't remember the name of the producer he's apparently famous karan johar who sorry again karan johar yes 
Kran, Kran. Oh yes. my God! That for you, you choreographed that football. Yeah. Oh and my God! Football. In fact, in one scene, my foot is the is is I've, I've starred in a film with my foot. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't dancing. It was because the lad couldn't kick the ball properly. I had mm. to kick the ball, so they filmed my foot. They kicked it, and but I mean that was an education about how professional the movie making was. I tell, I remember now, Karan, because he had a TV show, didn't he? With oh, he was Karan, yes. Yes, yeah. So, um, I mean, that was, yeah, I really enjoyed watching that, you know, seeing these lads dedicate themselves because they realised how important it was to be a Bollywood star. Yeah, I mean, that football scene, I, mean, I don't know, it just seemed, uh, again, for me, because I come from a culture where we, it's not too over the top. Like, we also have football games. And when they do things like how they did it in Student of the Year and all, we tend to make fun of them. Like, so they have to sort of underplay how good the yep. hero was and things. So it's just amazing to see how much you have experienced. Like all these things are absolutely uh, news to me here. And another thing I wanted to ask you was about women's football. Because you worked in, in women's football over the years. And uh, Manipur, I read an article somewhere where you said the women's football there is you know, quite good. And it's a factor yeah. is that they play with the boys. So is there like a more egalitarian system in the... Yeah, I, I coached the Australian women's team for the World Cup mm. and also the Vietnamese women's team. My view is they're footballers. They're not women, they're not men, they're footballers. Applies to both. Same principles apply when I work with anybody. But when I was in uh, Manipur, my assistant coach was a, a woman called Chauba Devi who, um, of, you know, and she was coaching the boys, which I thought was fantastic, very unusual. And she was a good coach, a licensed coach, knew her stuff, really good. And then one, on one of my days off, she said, coach, I'm going to coach the women. I said, oh, because I'd never seen women in India play. It would only, only been a male thing to me. She said, oh, I'll come along if you want. So I said, yeah, no problem. So I went along. I was so impressed. I've never seen so many six packs in my life. They were so fit, they were so strong. I put them through the same session as the elite 18 year old boys of Manipur, handled it no problem. And some of the one, I think, in fact, is playing now for Rangers in Scotland. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, you know, they were just really enthusiastic footballers who loved the game. The only sad part was I was told that once they got married, they had to stop. Uh, now that to me was insane, <laughs> you know. So, uh, but that again, I can't beat that, and obviously they couldn't beat that. And I also, I had a chance. I, I watched a Mary Com train. Mm. Uh, what? Oh, I would not argue with that lady. You know, <laughs> what a fighter! What a boxer! Magnificent. So, you know, it was. It seems to be my a friend of mine now, Alex Ambrose is is taking the, uh, the youth women's team and he is doing a fantastic job with them. And he, he shows me some of the work he's doing and some of the videos of the players. And the game is booming for the females. You know, they're getting good coaches like Alex and Chauba, you know, and they're gonna, you know, it's gonna get better. So many people, so many people, you've got a chance, you know? And if, if the girls aren't playing cricket, if they're getting channeled into football, there's a bigger chance. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the biggest uh, stumbling block for uh, Indian women's game right now is a lack of games. They, there's yeah. just no games. And whether it's a national team, the league hasn't happened since uh, February of 2020. And since then, I think women has they played two games. Two games against uh, some Central Asian Yeah, side. they're going to have to. Yeah. I had that problem in Vietnam. We couldn't play anybody. So we ended up playing men's teams. Hmm. And what I, did, what I did was we play the men's national under 23s team they would play one touch we play just normal the women mm. and it ended up a very very fair game because it's not easy to play one touch for 90 minutes for yeah. men it's hard work and they found it hard the girls found it you know, physically it was good pressure they were getting tackled and getting belted and then sometimes we play over 35 men where the pace had gone down but the technique was good so mm. that's the only way they're going to, and the only way they're going to get better is by playing with and against boys. And if they get beat, who cares? They get beat 10 mil, next time it'll be eight. Then it'll be six. And bit by bit, and they'll get better and better. And they'll suddenly realise, 
hey, this is football. I'm not a girl playing football. I'm a footballer. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's something that uh, we should look more into as a country who's trying to develop football as well. Uh, game time, especially youth system level, there is not enough games. We so I was doing some research and things. I think Japan plays around fifty odd games for an oh. age group school, and we You've play. Got to around, play games. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You've got to play games. That's the way. I mean, playing games is more important than coaching. And I'm a coach, <laughs> but <laughs> but if you don't play games, you've got no chance. It's how you learn to see the game. You see the we say see the pictures. You learn the geography of the pitch. You learn the culture of the game. Oh no, you, you have to play games. Totally agree with you. Got to play more games. Yeah. So in that vein, when you obviously been part of ISL as a broadcaster and as a coach as well, and generally when you look at India, they're doing a top-down approach. It would seem just like how China tried to do it. Um, I am not a big fan. So, what would your approach, your suggestion be? Because you worked in countries like Vietnam, who have done a phenomenal job in uh, you know sort of climbing up the ladder and improving their football. Yeah, I mean, when I went to Mumbai, it was magnificent. Uh, they were one of the most professional clubs anywhere in the world I've been with. Uh, they had everything organised. Everything was done for the players. Nothing was too much trouble. Uh, the only problem I felt was that agents were ripping off people. They were coming in and overcharging fees for themselves and getting salaries too much for the play. Now, that seems to have died down a bit now. I think the administrator has realised, hey, we don't need to pay that much for that player. You know, we'll get him for less or we'll get a different player who isn't going to cost us as much. Uh, and I'll be honest, there were some players, famous names who were cheating. Uh, and there were some great ones. You know, Robert Perez, for example, I thought he was fantastic when he was here, Del Piero. But there were others that were cheating. But one of the most fascinating players to me was Nicholas and Elka. Um, when we were there, I was with Peter Reed there again, and the president said, look, I've, I'm bringing in uh, Nicholas and Elka. And my first reaction was, oh, no, because he'd just been banned for putting mm. his... Yeah, his yeah, yeah. salute. Right? Uh, yeah, so... I thought, no, I, thought, I was really in, inside. I wasn't going to say it publicly, obviously. I'll tell you what, I've never been more wrong in my life. He was super professional, humble to the point of being shy, brought his wife and family along, uh, devout Muslim, but didn't push it on anybody, just was his business. Uh, if you said be there at nine, he was there at five too. He stayed after training, did extra work. Uh, they said wear one pink sock, one green sock. Nick would do it. I was really, really impressed. And, and oh, what a player! Yeah, what a player. You know, I'd say he realistically is the best player I've ever worked with. And he was 35 then, but he was built like a racehorse. He had this V shape with a six pack jumping out of his stomach. I was envious, uh, but he was a really, really good professional. Yeah, I mean, he is. He was a Chelsea player, and I'm a Chelsea fan, so. Oh, well, uh, you know uh, that, yeah. Yeah. People like him, people like Drogba, hmm. they, you know, they do, the game a service. You know, some of the other foreigners, cheat, and I've found that the higher the, the player is, the better you use the as a person. I, I've had some bad foreigners who've been. Some have been match fixing. Some have been alcoholics. Some have just been lazy cheats. Uh, but they're not the top boys. The big boys at the top are usually good people and great professionals. So, like another thing I wanted to ask is, you worked in Thailand, Singapore, Malaysia, Laos, India, Australia, all these places coming from England. So, within Asia, how would you uh, sum up the differences and nuances in culture? Like you obviously mentioned a little bit about Malaysia and Thailand, how the players and the families and things like that. Well, yeah, I get there... a lot of... I get a lot of uh, letters and emails and people call saying to me, I want to come to Asia. And, you know, I say, well, firstly, where is Asia? That's the first thing. Is it Japan or is it Laos or is it Bangladesh? And they look at me low as I'm stupid. I said, there's massive differences in salary, mm -hmm. facilities, population base. I mean, you cannot compare... India to allow in population, you know, it's just, it's impossible. So that's the first thing. Asia 
isn't a place. It is just huge conglomerate. And you, know, you have to realize that what you do in Japan is you cannot do that in Lao. Because the money, and of course, what it comes down to in most cases is of course is money. Whether we like it or not, the game is driven around money. Uh, and the more money there is, there will be better things going on. There's corruption everywhere in every country. Don't get me wrong. There's, there's got to be corruption. There's always, there's always corruption. And I think as long as you don't join it yourself, that's the first thing. If enough people say no to start, it will go on. Match fixing goes on. You know that goes on in India. Uh, it goes on in a lot of countries. That, to me, is the biggest cancer of the game in Asia. Don't for a minute think it doesn't go on in England. I don't think it goes on in the EPL because they can't afford to bribe a player. It costs too much. But there's a bloke who wears a referee's kit who isn't on that much money and he can control the result of a game quite easily. So it can go on. And the lower down you go in the leagues, if you've got a lad who's gambling and he's earning £1,000 a week and he's spending £3,000 a week in the bookies, you've got him. So it go, it, it can go on. So there's no one saying it's just an Asian problem. I think the reality is most of the big money is coming from China, from the Chinese bookies, but certainly it's going on all over the world. It goes on in Italy. That's been proven. It's not yeah. a secret. Uh, you know, and it, it goes on for different reasons. Some of it's purely money. Okay, that's greed. I hate it. Some of it's through the threats. Players get threatened. A half understanding. Sometimes there's no money involved. It's for power. It's for political power. In like in Thailand, you know, the big owners who own clubs, they want to win to be better than that man in the other club. So they'll make sure that their team wins. Uh, in Italy, it's often like for favors. Look, you lose this week, and we'll pay that back when you need a favor if you're going to get relegated next season. So it's complex, really is a complex scenario. It goes on in cricket, as you know. So uh, it, whilst there's money in the game, corruption will occur. And I just hope that's the biggest problem for the development of the game in Asia. One thing that I've been thinking of late is now, because of COVID, over the past, say, year, year and a half, we've seen football without fans. And it doesn't feel the same. But at the same time, the television companies are smart enough. They've put the voice in the background and the noise and they make you feel like there is fans over there. So um, now, obviously, England is open. The stadiums are full. But in India, it's still not the case. A lot of the Asian countries is still not the case. So how do you think uh, the fan interaction has been with the players in various countries? Is it different? Like, I know the Kolkata club is a lot more you know, vocal and... But the Bangalore club is very similar to an English crowd in terms of chants and songs and things like that. It is not really part of an Indian uh, sort of a fan base. Yeah, it's, I mean, it was awful watching some of the games in England, the EPL games, with no crowd. And if you didn't turn the TV noise on, hmm. it was terrible. The only good thing was you could hear players talking yeah. and you'd hear Jordan Henderson screaming at players. You'd hear Virgil van Dijk telling Trent Alexander, move, get there. And that, to me, was in many cases a good education for players mm. because I, I found that culturally, Asian players, most countries I've been in, are quite shy. They won't tell each other off. I don't know whether that's a cultural aspect or hierarchical aspect or just... I, I have no reason why, but certainly, you know, the, the British way is you get stuck into each other. It's not personal. It's business. It's your, your, you're trying to get the best out of your teammates. Sometimes you encourage, most like Henderson encourages and Van Dyke does. But there's times when you need to say, hey, bang, no, you do their job properly, son. And, and that's how a lot of young kids learn in the British culture. They learn through playing against men. And, you know, that, that's it's a tough learning. You know, I broke all my teeth. I had my nose broken, ears split off, just... Welcome to football, son. And you had to show in my days that you weren't hurt. You couldn't scream and squeal like they do now. It was the exact opposite. Whatever you do, don't show pain. And then you got accepted within the group. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, all the front teeth of mine are broken and fixed. 
because i got yeah. elbowed in the face yeah. <laughs> we're going for a header yeah but uh, yeah i mean that's now you laugh at it but at the time it was pretty painful and yeah it wasn't the best of the time i agree <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah so and now i'm just going to ask you a few things uh, maybe you like a quick fire questions and things like that okay yeah you you said uh, nicolas anelka is the best player that you overall worked with but keeping him aside in india when you were coaching who was the best that you worked with and the best you saw or you played against oh nabi nabi he was at uh, mumbai Mama with Nabi. me yeah yes as uh, he became a politician in the end i just knew him as nabi mm-hmm. a little full back he was mm-hmm. fantastic you know uh i didn't see the best of bai chung mm-hmm. i tried to sign him in 2005 in singapore but i couldn't afford his salary uh goalkeeper subrata paul totally insane but a great <laughs> lad great great goalkeeper uh, so he was good a, a player i never saw the best of and i wish i had uh, steven constantine speaks highly of him uh, pradeep and he was a lovely footballer he floated i saw him at the end of his career he mm. floated around a football pitch and of course chetri as done a beckham he has mm. become not only a player he's become like an icon yeah. and you've got to respect his intelligence for doing that you know he he has took his, his playing career on to the next level to become chetri good luck to the lad i'm delighted for him i, mean, I never sorry didn't score enough goals to me though so <laughs> yeah it was how in my was there yeah yeah <laughs> yeah now his numbers have come up i think uh, from the time that he was there but yeah. i've never heard anybody say this about uh, pradeep uh, the way you described him he scored a great goal in the you know the uh, against syria in that cup final and uh, he's a kerala player as well so there's a little bit of i just saw there. him when i had him at mohan he was a bit heavy uh, but you could see his brain his brain he could see things all over the pitch and he had lovely touch of the ball. Uh Nabi could play anywhere, anywhere on the back, the back. Uh I had a big center back called Anwar, mm. big power. He could have played in England without a doubt. He'd have physically handled England, not a problem. And I think that's the next stage for India. They've got to start looking at taking Indian lads who were born in England or in Europe, you know, and as long as they've got a mom or a dad or you know, or a grandparent who's indian i think is it called pio yeah P-I-O. player of indian origin yeah they've got to start it I mean, they, they, that's just not going to happen because it's a constitutional uh, this yeah. thing so they can't see i mean cuz if england if england did the same thing we wouldn't have a team we'd be playing five a side <laughs> terry butcher our big center half 80 caps for england yeah he born in singapore john barnes <laughs> born in jamaica Yeah. You know, so uh it, it just wouldn't it wouldn't have it just wouldn't apply. I mean, I don't I don't believe in this five year rule where if you live there you can become that I think that that breeds mercenaries. But I think if you've got Indian heritage, you should play for India. Yeah, I mean, I I am personally on the other mm-hmm. side like I feel if you allow that. I mean, first of all, it's not going to happen. I I know that because I've often spoken to people to see what is the scene. Yeah. But uh, I always thought I mean AFF is going to use misuse that to the point where they just going to ensure the national team plays they have 11 foreign uh, indian heritage players come and play from somewhere and they'll sort of do something and make it look like their football is improving while not looking after the grassroots that's my yeah, personal that's view a, that's a fair argument yeah yeah uh, yeah but if you want to win yeah yeah the best. but but at the same time you look at it how the world is moving like french football national team so many of oh. them uh, like that it qatar Absolutely. who's doing the same yeah so uh, i wouldn't have a team yeah <laughs> yeah yeah zidane is an algerian right at the end of the day algerian yeah. yeah yeah you know, so, there's loads of them different kante yeah. you know yeah the, 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 even if even if they're not born themselves there their mums and dads were born outside of france you know yeah yeah and when now qatar the way qatar is handling things and how they are well, they've a bit different they've, yeah, they've yeah, made yeah. a few south americans yeah um is islamic arabs yeah. and uh, you know they they have bent the flexibility their bamboo is maybe bending the right a little bit down <laughs> there yeah yeah so um me from mohan bagan they are having coach mohan bagan or do you have any story about the derby i didn't i didn't get get to play in one oh really didn't get didn't get involved in one no i would love to my mate 
coached East Bengal, Trevor Morgan. Mm. Yeah, 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 it's fantastic. Really enjoyed it, and I think the atmosphere is, is great. Uh, when I was there, Salt Lake City, the pitch was like concrete. It was a plastic pitch, a bad one, and it was it was rubbish. I'll be honest. Uh, now it's obviously a lot better football pitch now, but um, I I think the game itself is fantastic. I think there's also sometimes a bit of a a mythology because I read about people saying this is the biggest game in the world. Nobody knows about it outside India. Mm. You know, let, let's, not, let's not kid ourselves. Let's, <clears throat> let's sort of suddenly start saying, you know, everyone's going to talk about the, the Calcutta Derby. They're not. You know, they don't know about it. Uh, nothing wrong with that in the sense that maybe they should start selling it better. Yeah. TV coverage, yeah. better TV, English language TV coverage. Uh, interview the players, build it up, sell it all around the world. Yeah, it, then it could become known because having 100,000 people in there is great. It's great for the game. Yeah. And I think one of the things that we fail uh, as, a, as a footballing nation, I would say, is that uh, there are some great literature that you can read about what the history and things like that, you know, the Mohammedans and how they, Mohammedan, Bagan, all of them have history of 100 plus years. Yeah. And how they're also got a ethnic rivalry, Mohan Bagan and East Bengal. So we didn't really talk about like we. It's spoken very much so in West Bengal, in Kolkata, but the rest of the country they just know these like you know these are two powerhouses or historical clubs who play against each other. We personally, I think we could have done better packaging the whole story, saying that look, oh, this is the reason. Marketing the yeah, absolutely. I mean, like I said, Mohan Bagan has got thousands and thousands of fans and there was no shop they couldn't yeah. buy the shirts you know you, if they every fan had bought a shirt we could have bought 10 new players you know it was uh, it was so so way behind marketing wise it may have changed i don't know the isl was certainly different the isl i think has been a kick in the backside for a lot of clubs i mean my feeling as a foreigner would be keep the isl and keep the I League without without foreigners. Have mm. only Indian players, so don't have them at the same time. Have two separate leagues, uh, so that the best Indians can play in the I League and the ISL, with the best foreigners coming in to support them. And in the I League, you have the best Indians again, and you have the best young Indians coming through. So, for example, strikers. All the ISL clubs have got foreign strikers. Yeah. How on yeah. earth can you get another Chetri? It's so yeah. dirty. He's not going to get a game. But if he's playing 35 games in the I League for East Bengal or for Kerala, then he's got a chance. So, again, that suggestion was laughed at. But I mean, that's it's not my country. That was just my opinion. You know, so uh, that was, I felt, the best for the game to get the best yeah. for the Indian players. Yeah. For the Indian players, the best to play more games and the youth team lads to get more games with good men. Yeah, absolutely. I, mean, I sort of agree with the same because even when you go to the local games here, like the state leagues, there are still two foreigners. A lot of the yeah. teams, not all of them, some of them do have foreigners. Yeah. And a waste uh, of money. <laughs> it is a waste of money because yeah. a lot of them don't uh, qualify also. I mean, they don't qualify, they can't fill the criteria, so they never get to move up to the, say, I League 2 to I League yeah. 1 and uh, I League, not I League 1 and things like that. So it's just a waste of money and then you could have played a youngster. Another yeah. problem that you say, like you said, like it, India, for me, it looks like it's a country with a lot of hype. Like we just hype up a lot of things. We did this, we did this, we did this. But the results on the field is not that great. Like today, Mohan, ATK Mohan Bagan lost 6-0 to uh, an Uzbekistan team. So, uh, and everywhere, and I, I personally thought if you could get past them, potentially you could reach the final of the AFC Cup because the next so round would have been... what time will the coach get sacked? No, I don't think... No, no. <laughs> Those days are uh, not beyond us, but sort of, sort of. Uh, I don't know how yeah. these how they're going to run the club, but uh, yeah. it's a new entity, right? I don't know if it merged or if Mark Bagan is still there or waiting. It's a whole yeah. mess, like you said. But uh, it's a lot of hype that India has built up. So every time a young striker comes and scores two goals, everybody is up in arms. Like, yeah, he's the next guy. He's the next big thing. Gets shipped up to an uh, I-League team or an ISL team. He doesn't have game time, so he goes out wide. 
ends up being a wing back, a left back or a left like, winger or right winger. JJ, JJ like that? No, JJ was lucky in that he played a lot of the games in the middle. Right, because he yes. was a good player, I thought, JJ. Yeah, yeah. he um, played with I, Duffy, I, I Darren Duffy, uh, in Mohan Bagan, um, next to each I other. Thought, yeah, and there was another, there was another Indian lad, uh, Raja, Raja Paul, who... He, he wasn't that good in one position, but we moved him and he suddenly blossomed. Uh, mm. I think it was Raja Paul. No, Jewel. I also like Jewel Raja. There was, there was, Jewel, Raja, a, huh? Jewel Raja, who was a good little midfielder. I liked him. And there was another fella, Raja, but I can't remember his name, second name. Mm. It's, it's As you coach so many players, you get you know, so, so many names. <laughs> every name is, is you know, so, so difficult to, to say in some cases. The Thais are the worst, by the way. The Thailand names are impossible to learn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, is there any funny moment that sticks out to you uh, in your time in Indian football and by extension in Asian football as well? Well, I mean, in Indian football, I, I, I couldn't beat the skipping without ropes. I absolutely <laughs> love that. You know? But, I mean, I always remember sitting next to Brian Robson uh, in Iran and there was 100,000 crowd and there was 100,000 big men all the guards were big men with machine guns and it was nil nil with five minutes to go and I just turned around to Brian Robson and said Robo I hope we lose <laughs> you know because I didn't fancy getting out of that place you know? and he looked at me and said yep I think we might do that now we ended up losing one nil which wasn't a bad result with Iran because we'd drawn them nil nil in hot at home but uh you know, that, that was a scary place to go to. And and once when I was playing in Thailand, this was a long time ago, I was, I was playing uh, for a team from Bahrain and I went across to play in Thailand and we went into a small stadium and it was total silence. And I looked and it was full and the whole stadium was full of Buddhist monks. Oh. They couldn't couldn't talk. Yeah. They weren't allowed yeah. to scream. So we played in silence. Yeah, it was just a... <laughs> Absolute strain, a bit like the EPL last year, you know, yeah. pre-COVID practice, you know. But yeah, I mean, I certainly, uh, you know, love love the place. You know, I've had ninety nine percent good time. I've been lucky, met great people. You know, you get you, you have better places than others, of course you do. And that, and I'll be honest, it usually comes down to when you win the most. Uh, yeah. That's what I've, I wrote in the book. You can forget this posh word philosophy or project. The main thing is in Asia, win. If you don't win, you're not there anyway. Uh, long term is next week. Development is by winning more next week. So forget your, you've got to survive. Uh, I've lasted three years in about five different clubs or, and national teams. So, but that was all based on winning something. And I, I failed in a couple of clubs, Mohan and Kelantan. Failed. I've got to put my hand up. Didn't succeed. But, and I could blame other people. I could blame politics. We can all do that. But when I won, you know, it was important because winning for a coach in Asia is political power. So if you're winning, you can suddenly say, hey, let's, let's not get a bus next week. Let's get a plane. And you look after the players. Let's buy 20 more balls rather than, you know, but if you're losing, get your mouth shut. Say nothing, you know, and then that's that's the reality of coaching in Asia. Well, this is so fascinating. The whole thing. So, of all the Asian countries, where did you have the best time for you, player, coach, whatever it may be? Uh, on the pitch, Malaysia. You could say off the pitch, Thailand, but uh, on the pitch, Malaysia. I, I met some wonderful people there. I had three years in Johor, and you should see Johor now. The 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 prince. Has put mm. his money in, yeah. and it, it is world class JDT, world yeah. class now. Yeah, uh, I had three years in Parak, and I had half a year in Kelantan. But yeah, there's lots of great things in Kelantan as well. You know, so that was probably Malaysia is probably. <clears throat> if I had to retire, I'd retire to Malaysia. That's where you know I would probably go. The but Lao was fighting a battle, lots of battles, economic battles. But they were good people. The, the administrators at Lao were great administrators. I had a lot of time for the president, and the, Vipet, his name is, and the secretary, Keo. They 
they really, really pushed the game. A bit like in Manipur. Manipur people were great. So it's, it's hard to pin it down, but I'd say Malaysia if I had to. And um, But if I was going to come back as a cricketer, only one place, India. <laughs> Did you watch the test recently, the India England ones? Sadly, yes. Very sadly. Yeah. <laughs> Why is that? Because, that was a great, uh, great uh, series, right? Uh, I mean, they absolutely, I mean, isn't, isn't Kohli a wonderful leader? I, I could play for Kohli. Because mm. you could just see he would drive you to the limit. You know, I liked MS Dhoni when he played, but yeah. Kohli, I think, is Kohli, I think, is quality. Fire and ice, no? Dhoni and Kohli. Uh, but just, just the whole, the quality of the cricket was, was you know, it was every week, every day was different. Every session mm. was different. So, and, uh, and obviously, all the people now in England are saying Indians want to play in the IPL, didn't want to play in the last test. But that's yeah. what English is saying. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, it is what it is, right? Yeah. Sometimes they, people just argue about things. But I personally always enjoy uh, tours that happen in England because of the weather and the ball. Yeah. You use the dew balls, right? So it swings. It's bit, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it so it's great to see, especially now that India has a good fast bowling lineup. You're like, yes. yeah, finally, you'll see what happens when you go over there. So. I was brought up on uh, Chandrasekhar, Venkat, um, mm. Bishan Bedi. And yeah. my hero as a kid was Farooq Engineer. Really? Because he was my, yeah, he, Lancashire wicketkeeper. I was a wicketkeeper and, and, and he was Lancashire, where I'm from. So Farooq was my hero. And what a cavalier player he was, you know. So how comes the shift to football then? If you were so into football and cricket? Um, cricket, I wasn't good enough to make money. <laughs> <laughs> Simple as that. Football offered me money. Cricket offered me Nothing. I wasn't good enough to you know to make it. I played against some good cricketers, and I realised, poor, I was not going to make that next step up. Yeah, that happened to me also while playing football. I was like, oh, this this is beyond me. I'm not fast enough. I'm not strong enough. Yeah, I'm not skillful happen. enough. So yeah. uh, I'll just stick to writing about uh, football. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Yeah. So your favourite club is Liverpool, I see. Yes. Yes. You, they say in England you can. You can change your wife, you can change your religion here, but you can't change your football club. <laughs> <laughs> that is, you know, that is the important thing, you know. So yeah. uh, I, I was born in Anfield, right next to the ground, which, which I see is lucky. Mm. I was born at the same time Bill Shankly was around, which mm. I think is lucky mm. again. Uh, and so that's it, it, you cannot change your club. So that's it. You've got it. I think Everton's a great club. Yeah. And most yeah. of my family are Evertonians, but. I've got Liverpool, that's it. Yeah, I mean, when you were growing up, uh, in that time, probably Everton was the better team, right? After the great success of Liverpool had, Everton had a decent oh, no, spell in the 80s. No, this right? is... The, when I was growing up, it was the 60s. Okay, 60s yeah. Liverpool, Liverpool yeah. and Everton were good. Everton, mid-80s. Liverpool a bit later as well. I mean, both of them were fantastic clubs. You know, they, they do, you know, great jobs, both of them, in the community as well. Probably Everton do a better job in the community. They yeah, go I mean, around all the places looking after people. I think this is something that Indian clubs can do better in terms of giving back to the community or sort of yeah, helping yeah. out the community, which it's I think important. Is, yeah. Yeah. If you get if you get the kids, if, you know, if, uh, if a kid meets a famous player, he's his for life. He's got mm. him for life. You know, I, I met Shankly. He's got me for life. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Which we don't do. I think we're starting to do it now a little bit more than before. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I think a lot more to do because that that uh, emotional connection is often uh, it's weird. So I work in Bangalore now. So uh, there is a whole bunch like the Bangalore FC has huge fan base and a lot of young people, a lot of uh, people, middle class, upper middle class, that kind of uh, group of people. But the hotbeds of football, where football grew up, like you sort of had a Brazil of uh, Bangalore, it's called Gautam Pura, which has a statue of Pele and uh, all these kind of things. So those people follow the old clubs, the HALs and the ITIs and things. They like yeah. to watch the local football. So it's so widespread. I, I guess it's also because of varied as a country it is because in Bangalore itself, we have Tamil speaking people, Malayalam speaking people, uh, Hindi and Kannada and uh, all these. It's a very cosmopolitan place. So I'm just, it's it fascinates me because I really got into this. I feel like I should write a book at some point. Uh, Why doing not? All the research. Yeah. yeah Go for it. Yeah. Yeah. 
yeah about the culture of football it's been yeah. really interesting speaking to people and finding out and things so from that standpoint of view this standpoint i'm really really happy to have a conversation with you because it's been really funny a lot more funnier than i expected and right. uh, really enjoyable as well a lot of great insights so uh, i think i've taken a lot of your time as well so no uh, problems thank you so much i'm i'm going to buy the book so i shall send you shukriya uh, shukriya <laughs> i shall send you an email once i finish uh, this when is it coming out again october i hopefully covid has slowed it down obviously it's mm. published in australia uh hopefully it's going to be they say october but everything's delayed because of covid as usual you know, is it, is it, it'll it'll get there it'll get is there it, is there going to be an audio book as well uh not audio but there might be an ebook you know uh uh-huh. yeah yeah, yeah there's yeah. no one would understand my accent if i did it <laughs> 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 I'll have to get uh, I'll get Cheryl Khan to make make an audio book. That would be Yeah, Cheryl Khan, yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So, uh, thank you, thank you so much uh, for your time okay. coach and uh, I'll keep in touch and yeah, uh, hope to see you. The, yeah, send me the thing and I'll link and I'll share it for you. Okay? No, yeah, absolutely. I hope to see you back in the show soon. I hope. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.